the goal of TalkBank is to really make data available for an AI type of analyses, linguistic analyses, and so on. We have a variety of different banks. Um, and when we're talking about neurodegenerative, we also talk about uh, really acquired um, you know, neuro problems, which would include uh, TBI, traumatic brain injury, uh, and aphasia, uh, not really a degenerative problem. Uh, of course, it, within the neurodegenerative, um, we're really mostly talking about Alzheimer's, maybe uh, primary uh, progressive aphasia, and so on. Uh, so here, I, if I go to this link here, you can see, I don't know if you can still see uh, the Talk Bank page. Can you see that? I'm sorry, can you see the Talk Bank page here now? Yes, we can see. Oh, you're good. Okay. So here you can click on TalkBank and all these data and all these programs are available just from this one site, TalkBank.org. Um, I may come back to this in a bit, but um, for example, specifically, if you wanted to look at Dementia Bank, this would be the page for Dementia Bank. Uh, here we have some information about that. Uh, the, as Bjorn mentioned, the, the address challenges from uh, 2020, 2021, how you know how that was organized? How you get the data, um, and uh, really a lot of, of the other programs that I'm going to mention, uh, we could get from here. So I'll I'll go back to that later. Um, one of the other things we have is a TalkBank database, uh, so we can search the whole database, maybe not just for dementia, but for any of the other uh, types of talk that we have. Okay, let me uh, let me just go on here. So I think if we we're talking about AI for uh, you know Alzheimer's disease or for uh, neurodegenerative in general, uh, one thing that was found in a recent symposium that the uh, people for the Frontal Temporal Dementia Network uh, organized is that the two best predictors of you know cognitive or Alzheimer's decline are both language and memory, and actually language is a little bit better predictor than memory, although. You know, the, the, the lore is that um, people lose their memory in uh, Alzheimer's disease, but actually language is a very good predictor, possibly because of all the features of language and how easy it is to gather language data. Um, but in order to really, so some of the goals of, of understanding this are to achieve classification, evaluation of treatment, whether a treatment has been uh, effective or not, and, and prognosis of the, the course of the disease. And for, for doing this, really, you need a lot of data. So that's the main point of my talk, actually, is that AI needs lots of data. And I, I think everybody here understands that. Um, but really, one of the problems is that we just don't have a lot of data. So TalkBank is the largest open access source for data on persons with neurological disabilities, including aphasia, apraxia, stuttering, TBI, SLI, and so forth. Um, that isn't to say that there isn't data out there, but it's rather hard to get it shared. Uh, and so that's one of the issues really we need, I think, in general to talk about. Um, so in fact, when we look at dementia, there are various forms of dementia, uh, being able to predict um, that a person will have you know, cognitive and, and language decline is important, but we also would like to know what type of dementia uh, they are, you know, incurring. I think if you ever looked at cases of people with logopenic dementia, it's so it stands out so clearly that their problems are really uh, almost with pronunciation, and it's so markedly different from many of the other types of dementia. And of course, there's Parkinson, which is really a rather different thing. Um, so one of the big goals here, and, and this is important really for, for pharmaceutical companies who want to propose these treatments, is to find a decent pre-post measure uh, for understanding um, whether their treatments are actually in any way effective against, uh, uh, you know, in, in slowing maybe the decline of dementia. So, um, so I want to talk a little bit for at first about the talk bank system and then get back to studying that, how it would be used or talking about how it would be used for studying dementia. Okay, so we have these different talk banks and really we've, the one we've done for the longest period of time is for child language. Um, and, you know, in that area, I mean, we have something like 8,000 publications. 
but when we go to areas like Dementia Bank, we're actually now getting a large number, maybe 200, 300 publications based on Dementia Bank data. Aphasia Bank has many more than I've listed here. So each of these different banks um, has been in existence for a different period of time. And the longer it's been in existence, the, the more people have used it and how many publications have been used based on it. Uh, some of the principles, um, I'm just going to get a little water here. Oh, no, I don't want to answer the phone. Um, so some of the, I'm sorry, I'm on the, I'm on the, I'm on Zoom. Um, so some of the principles of TalkBank, first are the focus on spoken language, and then the principle of open data sharing. Of course, we do need to have password protection. So when people want to access TalkBank data, they uh, basically have to send us an email and ask for permission and, uh, and a password, but it's, it's really pretty open. We do ask that students uh, uh, you know, get access to the data by asking their advisors to become members. Okay, now one crucial thing about TalkBank is that all the data are in the same format, which we call chat, so that uh, you can compare across projects, across different types of disorders, uh, using the same set of programs, uh, same database, and so on, which is, you know, I think very different from certain data repositories where people just, you know, put their data in and it's really not comparable because, you know, they're all in different formats. Uh, and and in, long, in that regard, we really focus on interoperability um, so that we could, you know, move data in and out of Prot or Elon and so on um, and, and different formats. Um, uh, uh, yeah, for analysis. <clears throat> yeah, and because we have this single format, we can have software that is uh, compatible with that format, and we you know have a lot of different possibilities there. Uh, rather community oriented, we're trying to take input from people who are using the data and finding out what they need, and uh, also trying to be in accord with international standards, specifically for things like the core trust seal. Uh, the FAIR principles, trust principles, and so on. Okay. Um, now, one thing you have to remember about written versus spoken language, of course, is that, you know, and I think everybody here really understands that, is that there are enormous amounts of written language data and, you know, on the web, and it's so easy to learn language models from those. And the amount of, of spoken language is much more reduced, and particularly spoken language from people with, you know, neurodegenerative disorders. Uh, everything for spoken language in order to be, you know, really well done has to be transcribed, although, you know, we're getting increasingly uh, better results by using ASR uh, with, with certain data sets. Um, and, uh, and it has to be transcribed in a fairly consistent format uh, with, you know, metadata describing where this is all from and, and so on. Okay. And of course, there are enormous numbers of data sharing issues. Um, some of this, um, you know, is triggered by these uh, GDPR regulations, the uh, uh, ones that are put out by the European Union, which actually are, are often considered to be much more restricted than in fact they are. Um, that particularly when the data are de-identified and when you have informed consent, there aren't very any, any real <laughs> GDPR restrictions. Uh, one other thing about some of these data sets is that the profit motive is not always present. Well, that's certainly present with, with Alzheimer's uh, because of the incredible uh, growth of the problem you know, internationally and the need to, to try to find uh, ways of treating it. Uh, somewhat less perhaps with aphasia and with some other, other smaller groups like stuttering, yeah. So I wanna mention a little bit about the programs. Um, we have these basic set of programs called plan programs, really desktop programs, although you can run them on the web too. Uh, they're really, I would almost think of them as corpus analysis and uh, you know, mean length of utterance and lexical density and uh, all sorts of uh, you know, search, search routines and so on. Um, then one area that has been very profitable for people who are looking at aphasia is to look at the, um, retelling of a story. People there have been doing the Cinderella story. We also have the cookie theft, of course, uh, which was used more in, in, uh, in Alzheimer's research. 
Um, and looking there at what are the specific uh, patterns in that that are being used, which words, which lexical, which, which parts of the lexicon. And um, it's actually very, very uh, indicative of different types of aphasia and so on. So uh, discourse analysis through this, uh, these core lex methods that people are developing. Um, we've also been working a lot with ASR and forced alignment. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, I think that is pretty obvious, of course. And we have a system called FON, um, which can do very detailed phonological analysis, really phonological rather than phonetic or acoustic. Um, then on the morphological and syntactic analysis, we, at least for 12 languages, we have automatic analyzers. And I think that's actually turning out to be very important for uh, Alzheimer's diagnosis in that some of the higher, uh, more complex syntactic patterns can be picked up by the uh, grammatical dependency uh, structure that we, we can extract universally, or I should say automatically. Uh, we're starting to try to work with the universal dependency system um, in order to, to cover more languages, uh, although I think that will be maybe a little less accurate than what we have, but it still be uh, good in terms of coverage. Uh, and then in terms of the lexicon, we have about three or four different, you know, lexical diversity and lexical rarity measures. Um, then there's these things like uh, eval, CQPA, CNOA. These are um, measures that clinicians have used really for decades uh, that have all been automated um, in order to really um, make a single sort of one button analysis of, um, of all the different profile really of, of a given participant or perhaps of a whole set of participants. Then uh, I'm not going to go into the details about TalkBankDB, that's the database which links to R and Python for statistical analysis. Uh, another system called collaborative commentary is probably a little outside of the purview of this group. Uh, it, it looks at great detail at, in terms of conversation analysis and people can go in and make specific comments directly on the web I should explain that all of our materials can be played back directly on the web through the TalkBank browser. Maybe I can show you that if I have time. Okay, so um, let me spot my time here, yeah. So, uh, so one of the things we're trying to do is to set up a more automatic pipeline for getting the data in and uh, getting to the point of analysis. Uh, we do have a remote administration I don't think that's going to be ever totally automatic, but it does greatly facilitate data collection, uh, basically uh, through Zoom with participants. And um, it's a rather different thing from collecting data automatically through Alexa in the home, which, you know, of course is another interesting possibility, but right now we're focusing on really, um, uh, really a, a remote administration of a one hour interview with people. And then uh, running that through ASR, sentence tokenization, forced alignment. And then at that point, we can run morphosyntactic analysis through more and grasp. And then use some of these uh, measures that I talked about earlier, eval, uh, CQPA, uh, flu, flu calc, which is a calculator or calculates fluency and the discourse analyses. Um, we, we haven't really gotten to the last step that much ourselves. Um, Although um, working with the address challenge, uh, different people have taken the data and applied various deep learning and other types of machine learning models at that point. Okay, well, I mentioned all these banks. I should add that we're also beginning a psychosis bank, uh, which is, uh, will be quite interesting. Okay, so in terms of now turning to Dementia Bank, um, there, you know, as the last time I counted 165 publications based on dementia bank data, primarily on the PIT corpus, which is a, uh, a corpus of uh, mostly death descriptions with both, um, uh, you know, control participants and uh, people with uh, various levels of, um, of dementia as, me as measured by the MMSE score. Um, and with a little bit of data on progression, that is some of the patients were uh, studied multiple times, but but not all of them. I think their total patients were about 300 some. And uh, it, in the address challenge, we, we 
broke it down to about 265 patients. Um, so we had uh, the people at uh, Saturnino Luce and uh, Hydra Fase at, uh, and uh, Sofia de la Fuente Garcia um, worked with us in the address challenges. And um, the first address challenge really allowed for uh, use of our, um, um, of, the, of the transcripts that we had created. And in the second challenge, we gave people only the acoustic data. And then if they wanted to have transcripts, they would have to run ASR and so on themselves, uh, which actually they did rather well at. Uh, among the models that were used, uh, you can see all the lists there, uh, SVN, BERT, Ernie, and so on. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, people, yeah, question? Oh, sorry. Um, okay, and you know, a lot of people were using uh, uh, emphasis on uh, linguistic models, others more on the acoustic. Uh, some people talk about acoustic and they really mean things, something more like fluency, <laughs> amount of pausing. Um, so there, there's certainly lots of levels of acoustic analysis um, and, you know, grammatical relations and so on. So the accuracy, the highest level of accuracy of classification, you know, whether you were uh, having Alzheimer's or at least mild cognitive impairment or not, was up to 93%, which is, I think, getting pretty good in terms of classification. Okay, yeah, 237 files, and I think I've mentioned some of this. Um, yeah, this, so the baseline model, which the uh, Edinburgh people put together, uh, was got to 87% accuracy. And then some other models did a little bit better. Uh, the baseline model was able to predict the uh, MMSC score by about five points off. Uh, there was another model that got down to three points, so models, I'll point to that. But the hardest is to predict the decline. Um, and I think that's because of the lack of sufficient data. Um, but there may be also other issues there. So that actually is a very important thing. Uh, that, I should point out, though, is a little bit different from what uh, pharmaceutical companies are needing. They want to just see whether their um, treatment in a pre-post uh, sense is leading to any improvement. Uh, now, of course, you know, you, in a way, you are doing something longitudinally there. And, uh, you know, standard fact of psychometrics that if your test is uh, you can't do any better than the the the, the uh, reliability of your test. So we need high, highly reliable tests in order to predict, uh, you know, to see whether the pre-post uh, gain, hopefully, or or lack of loss, uh, is significant. Okay. So in that uh, data set that we put together for address, there was balancing for gender and age, normalization of the volume, the audio quality. But the audio quality was really not that good in the first place. You know, these were recorded in cassettes, you know, back in the, well, early 90s. And, um, yeah, we had to digitize them off of that. Uh, so, so I think having better audio data can help us a great deal. Um, yeah. And, and our eval program pulled out 32 linguistic measures. Uh, as uh, Bjorn pointed out in uh, his, and I think uh, also maybe the other talk too by Jonas, uh, the combination of features is really the, the most, most uh, powerful way uh, to get good classification. Okay, here's the baseline Edinburgh system, uh, basically putting together different things, yeah. Okay, uh, in that challenge, the results of the challenge, the highest results that were reported were about 89% accuracy, uh, F scores of, you know, 0.9. So I really doing pretty well, but, you know, maybe with better data, we could do better. Um, and very interestingly here, um, the MMSE score, there's, there was one group that did particularly well, music and audio research group at Seoul National. And I, I need to learn more about what they did. They, they st really stand out in terms of, uh, Right, a lower lower your deviation here, the better the score because you're trying to be, you know, very close to the prediction of the MMSE, which of course itself is not anything perfect. You know, we 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 don't have really truly gold standards in anything here. Uh, okay, so what are some of the uses of this? Um, certainly, classifiers uh, for detection. That will one thing about detection is that it helps uh, families. Uh, in planning for the onset of dementia. 
Um, and uh, I think that's very important, people understanding. Um, Bjorn mentioned the idea of, of um, having contact with clinicians. And I, I think if I actually, if I went back here a bit uh, to talk about how we use eval um, for these 32 linguistic measures, this is something that clinicians really are, are relying on. They want to know specifically, you know, what aspect of language is something where they can train better. Uh, is it low diversity, low lexical diversity? Is it pausing, disfluency, and so on? Um, and of course, yeah, emotion, that is a great one to train to have better emotions, yeah. Um, then there's the, you know, progression assessment. Oh, I'm sorry, the type assessment. So in, in aphasia bank, we're able to really focus on, you know, Broca versus Wernicke versus conduction um, and uh, <clears throat> anomia. Uh, or even global aphasia, um, and uh, you know the different types of aphasia, uh, and use the measures to really uh, categorize people, um, and they do fairly well actually by use, putting together different uh, different linguistic measures. Um, and then, uh, so you know, can that be done for uh, the neurodegenerative side, so that we can separate out? Uh, you know, frontal temporal dementia, even Hicks disease from uh, uh, from logopenic and and, uh, and and to make it clear what, that it's not Parkinson's and, and sometimes these are comorbidities. So, you know, that's 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 interesting. It, it's a challenge. And I think one that almost hasn't been done at all. I mean, we don't have enough data to even start doing that quite yet. Uh, then there's the progression assessment. Uh, we'd like to understand the rate of change. And this, of course, would be actually really important for uh, you know, biological studies of Alzheimer's is try to understand why are, why are some people uh, you know, slow in progression, others uh, very rapid, um, and the types of change, um, which is, you know, again, some of this, we, just without having the data and the details, um, you know, we, you know, there are studies in the literature, but, but you know, nothing can be replicated. We don't have the data. Uh, it's not shared. It's not a, a, a general method. You know, that's a problem, right? Uh, so current work really focuses on detection. But uh, if we have more longitudinal data, we can really get more into the progression assessment. Okay, so the, uh, the protocol that we're using um, is the Dementia Bank Protocol. Um, which is based very largely on the aphasia bank protocol with a few extensions uh, that includes this, the cookie theft uh, in order to match up with, with previous data. Oops, I spelled met rescue wrong. Cat rescue is a great picture. I, I think you can, by the way, you can go on our website and you can get all these materials, download them, the pictures, everything. There's a Norman Rockwell picture of going and coming. And, you know, people are describing this stuff. Um, right, and then perhaps the most uh, indicative uh, of all of these is the Cinderella story retail. Uh, you know, we basically give them the little picture book of the Cinderella story, uh, let them review it with its with the words are taped over, and then after they've reviewed it, could you please retell us the story? Uh, then there is a uh, how can you make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? Uh, you know, which uh, is of some use. I'd say the Cinderella is probably the most important. And by the way, peanut butter and jelly is not a universal. So we have different, different sandwiches made in different countries. Uh, then uh, the uh, people collecting now new data for, for a dementia bank also have a personal story, which is very interesting. Unfortunately, the problem with the personal story is that it, it includes a lot of uh, identificatory material. So we probably are not going to be able to share that data uh, over a dementia bank. Then we have the Boston naming, the, Mo the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, and a lot of demographics of, about people. Uh, so data collection is often at uh, Alzheimer dementia centers. Uh, we're using, uh, we've created Zoom versions of the protocol so that people can administer it uh, uh, remotely. And that actually works really well. Uh, particularly during pandemic, of course, but even post pandemic, it's a really great people don't have to drive in and they can still run through the pr complete protocol. So in a way, it's tele not so much teletherapy as tele assessment. 
uh, and which I think opens up uh, greater possibilities for longitudinal assessment. Uh, people are, you know, very willing to, you know, put in maybe that one hour or 40 minutes uh, on occasion, uh, rather than having to, you know, drive in and so on. Uh, now, another interesting idea, of course, is somewhat discussed already in the pre two previous talks, is the possibility of using the voice activated systems uh, like Alexa or Siri in the home and uh, doing some work with Xiao Hui Liang in, in U University of Massachusetts at Boston, uh, setting it up so that that, is, uh, that system is used just in the home without sharing it back over the web. If we could get these systems to really work, and I, I see there was some compliance issue that Bjorn mentioned, that, that is definitely an issue, um, then we would be in the same position we have with another project in TalkBank, which is called HomeBank, where people uh, record from their uh, children, these are usually you know, young children learning language, uh, 16, well, basically 16 hours a day. It's a day long recording. And you know, of course we don't have transcriptions of this, uh, but it is great for diarization, understanding who's talking when, how much speech there is, and so on. Okay. So in terms of data sharing and standards, we obviously need to go beyond the PIT corpus, but uh, and and there are people who are promising us some of their data to be contributed. Uh, but so far it's 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 uh, not been a lot that's been contributed. Um, we need more languages, more groups, and and it would be great if we were using a shared this shared protocol then we could have a uh, real comparability across uh, the, these different data sets. So that, I mean, that's what we basically do in all the other data uh, bases, TBI bank, aphasia bank. And so it really, I guess I'm trying to proselytize a little bit to try to get people to share their data with dementia bank. Uh, as I say, the issues with IRB and GDPR are all solvable. We have a, a lot of, of suggestions on the website about people who have questions in that area. Um, and then, of course, there's a the question of how to merge together all these data types, particularly if you have all these uh, biometrics and people with their fit watches and measuring their EEG, how are we going to put that all together uh, will be really interesting. Okay. Uh, uh, finally, I just want to point to the study that we're actually doing right now, for, which is from Alyssa Lanza, uh, now has something like 40 uh, participants, much better audio quality. It's just, you know, stunningly different. Uh, and it, you know, we can basically do ASR on it and quickly uh, run it through uh, 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 <clears throat> uh, forced alignment and so on. Um, and so we're hoping to do some longitudinal tracking there. Okay, I think that is, yeah, okay. So the goals overall of what we're trying to do is build the corpus more to get beyond the pit corpus to have, you know, better ASR, better discourse analysis. Um, I think the clinicians are very interested in the collaborative commentary side. I don't know that that will really work for AI. And in a, in a sense, also provide more benchmarks. I mean, the, the address challenge is a benchmark, but we perhaps need some more benchmarks for uh, audio quality and so on. Uh, links to the other biomarkers and the, finally the application, you know, the, sort of the end goal of the application to clinical trials. Um, okay, thank you.